you know, this whole podcast from the deep end came out of, of me wondering about stuff my whole life and really getting into it, reading every scripture I could, every sci-fi novel I could, every piece of spiritual stuff I could, every piece of quantum physics, bi biochemistry, uh, the whole thing. I've just, what the hell is going on here? And I've, I've sought to lay out a chain of events from nothing all the way through being, life, and consciousness, using the three essential processes of everything is complexifying, differentiating, and semi-permeable. And that's how we move through evolution, the hows and whys of it all. Also, I've tried to give some different ways of thinking about our life here on planet Earth. And with my two cohorts, we fleshed out some pretty good stuff. And I'll be honest, I never leave a podcast without having changed my mind in some way. Within the scheme I've laid out, there are certain processes that can actually facilitate or impede the forward motion that is the evolution of all that is. And that's what I want to go to today. Metaphysical backwash. And the first place I went is Newton's Laws of Motion. And Newton's third law of motion is important for us in this journey to see how it plays out in all the corridors of our lives. All forces occur in pairs. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And this reaction then acts back on the original action. You see how this works? We're talking about wave propagation, really, when you get into it. But this isn't just true in physics. It's also true in social psychology. I mean, remember Freud? He talked about reaction formation. Whether in thinking or in politics or in trade or in anything, it just feels sometimes like we're going two steps forward, one step back. Oh, no, one step forward, two steps back, over and over, one or the other. And we seem to be in the midst of a huge reaction, a reaction to diversity and a reaction to an uncertain future, all fraught with fear. Now, many see this reaction as we got to put on the brakes, we got to stop our forward motion, and we need to reinstate some imagined understanding of the past. We can't throw out the baby with the bathwater, can we? Over and over, we see that this, this reaction piece is part of it. In an engine and the way internal combustion works, if there's no back pressure, you can't get the torque you need to move forward. And if you, you really look, go, go by the ocean where, where there's some docks and some, some pylons, and you'll see this place where backwash is. It brings in these eddies of trash, and you can see how they just kind of keep backwashing and going into it. And I'm going to suggest that backwash is integral to the whole process of evolution. But the question is, does it impede the flow or does it allow us to reflect, reconsider, and reimagine? You see, you can do different things. And right now, that backwash is causing huge rifts in the human family. The, the human family, it, it just, I mean, let's face it, the future doesn't look like the past. The, the maps many of us have been given by our parents and by the, by the past no longer fits the terrain we're in. Our young people are literally training for jobs that don't even exist yet. We've expanded the human family into a global family, and our understandings mostly go no further than trade issues or self-interest, while the whole shebang is growing and groaning and screaming for us to look at the whole shebang to get over our geopolitical boundaries, if you will. You see, backwash is integral to the laws of all motion, but it can either be an evaluation event or an utter impediment to the very life we seek to grow. Backwash, reaction, it's come back now to affect the original action. Our trade agreements, our laws that we've instilled around the planet, our democracies, and what's happened, and, and I'll be honest, my greatest fear in all this backwash event that we're in 
is that our fears are being turned into hate. And it's happening to me too. I feel great animosity towards those who uh, uh, are, 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 are being led astray. And I, I, I feel bad about that. Turning fear into hate. So metaphysical backwash, it's important. And it's important to, to reevaluate. I think that's part of you know what, what we've talked about over and over is this loop of reconsideration. It's a process. It's not a place we get to and that's it. The journey is our home, as some have said. So my cohorts, Bob Hayes coming from Florida, Mary Ann Ruddis coming from Spokane Valley. I'm here on the South Hill in Spokane, Washington. And um, I'll start with you, Bob. I just gave my metaphysical backwash uh, shotgun blast. What say you? Uh, well, it, and you, you could know, be a downer Debbie today, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, joy. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Um, I think what you're getting at in using the term backwash is, is what other, some other people have called the pendulum swing how anything that occurs, uh, any uh, new idea or new direction uh, can be uh, likened to a pendulum that then swings in the opposite direction. So you, you know, a president wins an election and then the pendulum swings and the president's party loses the midterm election. So it, it makes it difficult for he or she, she hopefully at some day, uh, will is able to move their agenda forward. And we've seen this constantly, you know, not just in politics, but in, in most everything else. And the question becomes, how far does that pendulum swing or how, how strong is the backwash uh, and how do we react to it? And I think that the thing that, that we need to, to, to be careful about is overreacting when there's a reaction against something that we're supporting and we need to be more uh, calm about it. We need to be more focused. We need to be more patient. Uh, many of the things that I find difficult, uh, <laughs> but it, but it seems to be a natural occurrence. You know, uh, you know, the universe is, is, is organized in certain ways that we're beginning to get glimpses of and, that uh, that uh, third law of, of motion, as Newton described it, uh, seems to be a characteristic that we're going to just have to learn to live with, and we're going to have to to deal with that in our plans if we want to if we want to change policies on climate. We have to realize that there's going to be opposing forces to that, and we have to realize that we we have to come up w with ways to deal with them. Yeah, and that's true for just about everything we we encounter yeah. as human beings. And 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 I and I mean, it's already part of everything. And I think, uh, you know, that mediating the reaction is is a huge piece of it, so that it impedes less, and uh, again yields reflection and reimagination and a whole series of those kinds of things. Marianne, what say you? Well, you know, I think you know we. We're faced with problems in the world, and we try to fix them. And then as we try to fix them, then there's these unintended consequences that may occur, um, which is can be considered that backwash kind of thing. And so then we find ourselves in this place of, okay, so what do we do now? And I think that you mentioned that... Um, Fear turns into hate. And I think when these things start happening, we get afraid because we see that uh, the harm. And I think that's part of it is when when that backwash includes harm to others, harm to the planet, harm, then then that creates that fear. And then we start to get very militant about we need to fix this. You know, we need and we cannot we can no longer tolerate all of those different viewpoints that may not want to address these problems. And so I think that if we can alleviate the fear and, 
And part of it, I think, is when we look over history and we see the things that have happened, and we, so when we're trying to change things now, our mind goes back to the disasters that have happened in the past. And, and Red Hawk, you used to talk about this all, all the time, about new wine and an old wine skin. So we're bringing forward these old ways of thinking and trying to put something new into the consciousness, into the world. And we're, we're connecting with old ways and old things that, that have happened before, and that impedes us. And so how do we refresh? How do we take these back well, this backwash to use your term as a a time to learn how to accept and to change? Yeah. Uh, I think you know what you said, Bob. Yeah. And and we are learning. I mean what we're seeing now in America and around the world is a new iteration of reaction. It's a new understanding. And you both said something that is very important to this whole thing. Uh, Bob talking about owning and seeing that this is part of it, and Marianne saying there, it's the unowned parts of reaction that get us in trouble. If you really look at the Civil War, it really comes out of the unowned dealing with our, our own reactions, and the reaction went too far. The South set itself up in an aristocratic system that was basically... Uh, really worked well with with London and England and you know as a colony as colonies uh, and uh, they had governors you know that were very tight with the English and what happened was the War of Independence they they still were set up as an aristocracy and all the stuff they didn't deal with ended up compounding and the reactions got reactions upon reactions and it created a whole culture. That, that literally allowed very brilliant people to have their thinking corrupted in such a way that even though they knew they were doing wrong, they still did it with nobility and dignity. And uh, I have learned so much in studying that part of, of American history because we're in a new iteration of the same thing, if you will. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, it's... It's the unowned stuff. And this is, you know, I'm not a big Biden fan, but I'm very proud of him and the way he's dealt with stuff. Uh, it's, you know, I'm with Bob. I'm not very patient. <laughs> and it's kind of like, God damn, get on with it, dude. Uh, and what he's done has, has been very well thought out and is starting to grow some roots, I think, uh, in, in terms of understanding uh, and how things are set up and and. and the huge impediment that today's reaction in America is and how it is not only divisive, but it is contrary to the original action. And I think that we're seeing how that is playing out in real time uh, and in at least my endocrine system because it riles my ass up. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. And, and patience has never been my long suit. I... I really get frustrated sometimes by the short-term memories of people that, uh, that don't know anything about history. They don't, you know, they, they buy into, today they're calling them memes, but, the, you know, the idea that the South will rise again or the idea that, that socialism is a bad thing. When if you look at history, you begin to see some of those forces that you were just mentioning, Red Hawk, and... We, here we just we just passed Labor Day, and people, very few people realize that less than a hundred years ago there was no such thing as an eight-hour workday or a five-day work week, and that people were literally killed trying to establish an eight-hour workday. They were the the companies that wanted them to be working sixteen hours a day hired thugs to beat them up and murder them. Yeah. And we, we forget that. When, well, you know, I, on, on, on Facebook, I saw these pictures of these children, six years old, going off to work yeah. to shut clams yeah. all day. Uh, you know, so, amen, brother. <laughs> yeah. I see and, that. You know, and how do you fight the forces that don't want to teach history 
They just want to teach. I don't even know what it is they want to teach. They want to teach everybody to be happy. An imagined past. They want to teach an imagined past. Go ahead, Marianne. Well, I was going to say, I think, you know, what you said is so true uh, about the the people's memories. They don't know or, or their, their knowledge of history, you know, our rights can be taken away just as easily as they can. And they were fought for. They were, people died for those. People died for women to get the vote. People died for women to choose. They, people died in the civil rights movement. People died to get labor um, laws passed. And, and we forget. And so people don't, they just assume that that's always going to be and regardless of how they vote or what their political stance is they don't understand that those are the very things that can be taken away again and you know something i i mentioned last week i don't know if it was before or after the show or during the show uh but uh the whole concept about memory and remembering and the world needing a new religion i want to go back Go back to our, our stuff on religion and God and all that stuff. The word religion comes from the root religare, which is to relink. It is to link ourselves honestly and truthfully to what has been. Uh, it is allows us to, uh, at least in my life, to read the writings of Buddha, or actually the words of Buddha. Someone else wrote them down. I can read uh, Hebrew scripture the midrashes, I can go through, all of that is religion, it relinks me. However, it has to be honest. You know, when we started being honest with the historical Jesus, you know, a peasant with an attitude, who the hell is this guy? Uh, that you, you know, something new happened. Albert Schweitzer saw Jesus as a deluded apocalyptic. Over and over, we've had to face new understandings. Now, are these the real ways? We don't know. But they're honest uh, approaches to what is a very mysterious and interesting study of ancient scripture. Religare, when we are honest about our past, even as the Civil War, even with civil rights and things that you two have just mentioned, climate change, that is in my mind, true religion. When it connects us in such a way that we move a little closer to living our lives in accord with the overall reality that is uh, life on this planet. Does that make any sense? Yeah, you know, and, and what, what that made me think of is, is history is happening right now. We are laying things down. And what's that saying? That history is written by the victors. And so as we start to examine what we've all been taught as what is history versus going in and looking at alternative ways of, of seeing that um, or alternative voices of seeing that, it makes things really fuzzy and it makes things unclear. And I think that's part of where we're at right now. It's Nobody's really sure of anything right now. And so this fear is just bubbling up um, because we want to, we want certainty. We want to know, we want to feel like we're yeah. good. We're doing the right thing. And we've always had a way up until our generation to look at the future as a continuation of the past. And there seems to be a quantum leap here that, the future is not going to look like the past. I mentioned that earlier. And I think that that's a source of a lot of fear. And that fear is being exploited by moneyed interest and greed and a whole series of those things, which are part of the backwash to the backwash. Yeah. And uh, part of that uh, idea of honestly looking at history is to take the good with the bad or the bad with the good and to try, as, as Marianne was just saying, to see alternate viewpoints of, of uh, different historical events. What, was, what were the values of the losers? What were they fighting for even though they lost? And we go back, again, we, we've talked about signposts and guideposts and all these kind of things. If you go back through history and, and, and try and look at events 
through the lens of these guideposts that we, that we, we keep bringing up, uh, fairness, uh, justice, so forth. And then we can begin to say, well, wait a minute, this event as is being taught or as, as we uh, believe happened was unjust. And there was something to the uh, viewpoints of those who were not able, whether it was for economic reasons or just for the numbers game or whatever, to get their slice of justice. And we got to realize that when we're doing this relinking, part of that relinking is to pick up the broken pieces of the quest for justice that people were not able to uh, achieve in the past and bring them forward to our present and future. And, and you and know, the first time democracy. I, and the first time I saw that done uh, with, was think of the, the program Roots. We, we all remember yes. that. That yes. was a look. We got to follow what it was like to be a slave and be free in Africa and be captured and what happens in vectors to the family. I think of all the pictures of slave ships that, that uh, right-wingers don't want us to see uh, uh, because there were so many slaves that they were laid out on the deck as well as everywhere else that, because of their worth. You know, that, that whole process and evoking it and being honest with it is so painful because we did that. We did that. Uh, and yeah. uh, I, I'm not feeling, I don't think it's about trying to make me feel guilty. I think it's about trying yeah. to make me feel whole and complete. And to, to see that to be whole and complete means that, that we have to own those pieces. In my family of origin, denial, I'm the only one that was speaking the truth except for my mom in probably her last six weeks of life when she was on pain meds. And boy, did I get a lot of truth out of her. It was, you know, my brother and sister, whew, wow. Uh, they made, they, they've created provisional universes and they keep everything else out. Uh, and I don't want to do my family of origin work on this podcast, although I'm always <laughs> doing my, my family of origin work. Um, but I think this whole owning, you know, I always say, as bad as crow tastes, it's better warm than cold, so eat it quick. Uh, and I, I think that part of the reaction part of us is is fraught with denial. It, it wants to, again, the way I phrased it earlier in my shotgun blast was uh, to create a, a, a new future on an imagined past. Uh, and we... we, we it doesn't work. It has no well, place to stand. Know, Go ahead, Marianne. Well, I was going to say, you know, and it's not just denial that it happened, but it's it's denial of any any reason why we should even consider it because that was then and this is now, and those people did some bad things, but that doesn't mean we are going to do them. So let's not even look at them and let's dismiss that. And like you said, we have to bring that that forward because we have to understand what human beings are capable of. And I think human rights is a radical concept. The idea of democracy, bringing democracy forward, and that every single person has rights. And that is something that we have to um, we have to solidify yeah. much more than than we have because they're being taken away. And, and yeah, you know, what, one of the critiques of historians right now is they try to judge people of the past by today's standards. I right. don't think we can do that. I don't think that's fair. I think when we try to uh, demonize Thomas Jefferson because he had slaves, we forget what he was stuck in and the culture and and yeah. that whole thing. Go ahead, Bob. I, 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 no, 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 I agree with you. To, up to a point. Uh, I think that we don't want to demonize history and we don't want to make people feel guilty about what their ancestors did. But we have to be honest about the fact that this was, by anyone's judgment, uh, we'll use Thomas Jefferson as an example. Yeah, he was in a society that, that condoned 
slavery. But still, it didn't help the fact that he forced, I uh, can't remember her first name, uh, Hemmings, to have his children and then deny their existence. And yeah, it, 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 we can't condemn him for it, but we can say, wait a minute, this was a bad thing. We, yeah. we should not have we should not have done that, and we should not allow our glossing it over to open the doors for for other unjust things to happen. Yeah, and I think we well, also know, need you know, to put that in context and understand that the human family is coming out from a dark, dark cave, and that that we're slowly, slowly learning about compassion and equity and equality and egalitarianism. And Mary Ann used the word democracy a bunch. Amen, sister. Uh, we're learning about self-rule and, and how complex and difficult that is uh, to keep an education system going and all that. And we're seeing backwash in all those places. Uh, uh, you know, people, people are afraid of the, not just the future, but they're afraid of the past. And when you start looking through the, the uh, lens of fear, you begin to see things in a way that um, is very difficult to find the redemptive peace in them, if you will. Mary Ann, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, and it's not necessarily that we should not have done that in the past because people were living, like you said, in context, in their times, and they were doing what was what was they needed to do at the time but not but but consciousness changes you know and the thing that popped into my head was today's criticism of people that are um, advocating for climate change and all of the criticism that comes at, at them because they fly in jet airplanes and it's like how dare they fly in an airplane and if a private jet no less um, using up all that fuel while they're out there espousing climate change well the ideals still there and until we have a better way of being able to get from here one day maybe we can transport but not yet you know to get from here to there then people are going to still be using um, harmful systems I guess, in order to move the needle towards a better world come, going forward. Amen. Yeah. Okay, and Bob, we're coming up against our, our thing, so final comments? Well, I, I guess uh, I'll kind of go back to what I said earlier, that we, we have to, uh, Marianne, Marianne's favorite term is discernment, at least one of her favorite terms. And I think that we need to to really, really, work hard at trying to discern what is the truth about history, what is the truth about the important events that happened historically and how they're affecting us today. And we have to be very, very careful to try and weigh the good and the bad in, in everything, in every event that happens. We can't just... Uh, throw it in a little box and, and, and think that we've got, uh, we've got it contained, when in reality we don't have an idea of how extensive uh, things happen, the, the unintended consequences and so forth. So, again, it, like everything else that we talk about on this, this uh, podcast, we need to be more discerning in our thoughts and our actions. Marianne, final comments? Well, I would just say um, I agree 100% with what Bob just said. And so what do we do going forward? I think that's where we have to, and, and somebody mentioned earlier about personal responsibility. So we do have some responsibility here to educate ourselves, to discern what, what it is that we want, to get active in our communities and get active in the our external world and um, try to make the world a little bit better. Amen. And, you know, I like guns. I know I don't have a lot of guns or anything, but uh, I was brought up NRA, and uh, I've shot a lot of different guns. And people say, well, hey, you ever shot a three fifty seven? And I go, yeah, I didn't like it. 
because the reaction was so great. You got to completely set your body in a different place, your arm, you break your damn arm shooting one of those things. You see, we have to accommodate the reaction. We have to somehow think about uh, these rockets that are going into space. They have all this thrust, but what has to happen? They have to accommodate the thrust at the ground level. They have to do something with it so that the rocket can go. You see, there is a way for it to find goodness, if you will. <laughs> you know, we've talked today a lot about fear, but there's a whole other side of things, and it's called bliss. It's this extreme happiness place. And, you know, I don't know about you, but part of my journey, I came to it through bliss. You know, uh, when I was young, I just felt like a free spirit and was all over the place. Psychedelics blew my mind, my heart, everything opened. I knew that the sea of Ananda that Vishnu floated on in, on his, his big snake, the sea of bliss was real and true. There is a place where we can be where it all makes sense. Some call it extreme happiness. I don't like the word happy. It has too many consumer connotations today. But I do like the word bliss. I do believe that love is a path to this place where even on the on being crucified on a cross, someone can, can find a moment of this truth that is life, consciousness, and love. It's bliss. All the greats touched it, and they sought to share it. All we have to do is relink. My friends, God's peace.